Welcome to the Justice For You podcast, brought to you by Wagner High VSU, where students of color acknowledge and discuss African-American struggles with African-American fighters. In this episode of the Justice Now podcast, we talk with Lynch G. Newman II about a number of issues affecting African-Americans. Hello, would you like to introduce yourself? Yo, 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 yo. No, oh. I want you to ask me about myself. You want me to ask you? No. Okay. Uh, 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 uh. Who are, what do you do? What do you do? Uh, well, before what I do, my name is Lance G. Newman II. Um, I also go by Mr. Spread Love Around the City. All right. That's a very interesting. Very What's interesting your name? name? I am Jeremiah McDonald, a uh, senior in Wagner High. Okay. Uh, Mr. Newman, what would you say your profession is? Oh, I would say my profession is a renaissance man. Do you know what that means? Uh, enlighten me. Okay, so like the renaissance had a whole bunch of stuff going on, like arts from like painting to sculpture to architecture to like uh, other stuff they were doing, like religious thought and all types of stuff in the renaissance, right? So to be a renaissance man is to have your foot in all of those bags. And I like to consider myself um, a, a, a mini bag footer. That was the same time period with Arthur's and um, artists like Leonardo da Vinci, mm -hmm. Raphael, Michelangelo, mm -hmm. Donatello. Such. There we go. There you go. You named all, right. all the Ninja Turtles. I'm here for it, bro. Good all job. All those named after great artists. Great job. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So what experience do you have with food, de food deserts, Mr. Newman? Ooh, food deserts. So I live in the West End, right? I live off uh, 36th Street. And there is literally one restaurant that we can go to. It opens up at 11 a.m. and it closes at 7. And that is in walking distance from my house. So, like, when we talk about food deserts, it's always about how you can access food in a short distance like what what access to food you have in short distances where i live literally there's long john silvers which is disgusting um not like the food i like long john silvers or whatever but like that particular restaurant uh i i just don't think they care too much which who cares right you're right. in a fast food restaurant, like whatever, right? Um, but like there's the corner store, you got a shorties, whoop, whoop. Um, and then you got Southern Hospitality. And like those are the only pl places that I could um, eat. So like my experience with food deserts are always very, um, I don't know, it's, it's very interesting. It's like I'm making sure I'm eating before I go home or um, I'm making sure like, like going sh food shopping is a big thing in my house where we have to do it once a week on like Sundays and we have to make sure we have enough food for the rest of the week because we know after 7 p.m. there's nothing to eat. Understood, understood. Um, Mr. Newman, you're a uh, fighter for justice, right? Uh -huh. Would you say that food desert is something we should fight for? Uh, I mean, uh, fight against. Mm -hmm. So you think we should stand up as a justice union and add that to our criteria of things to fight against within mm -hmm. the government? Right on, yeah, no. Um, yeah, heck yeah, heck yeah, we should fight against. I mean, so food instability, and that's another thing that's like one of those, a lot of issues that we have can be black or white, you know what I'm saying? It's very binary and like this affects these people and this affects these people, but food deserts really affect everybody um, that live in that area. So heck yeah, it will be something to fight for. And also it's something that you could have momentum behind in that government officials and the people that create these laws or even business folk, right? Um, they would give a sympathetic ear and maybe a sympathetic dollar to the cause. All right, I love your mindset there. Mm. So I'm gonna connect two problems here. Mm. So along with the food desert problem, do you think that has any connection with the homeless problem? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, like when we think about cost of living, right? Like, how much does it cost for you to live right now? Uh, As a senior in Wagner, like for you to live, and we're going to account for like everything your parents already do, like for you to just live, how much do you think it costs? I I wouldn't have an estimate. I'd probably say a couple of hundred, maybe a thousand. Cool. Wow. A couple thousand. That's beautiful. Like that that works. It's like the cost of living for an adult um, in Louisville, Kentucky, the average rent is a thousand dollars plus. Like it just went up. It didn't used to be that, but the average rent is a thousand dollars plus. Food prices have gone up significantly, right? Um, do you think Louisville is a like a we have like a high transportation system, buses, trains. Do you think we like uh, can get around easily? I've seen the Tarkin stuff and I know how to write it. Mm -hmm. So I know that there is transportation, but as mm -hmm. far as the 
efficiency of it right. or how often it is the reoccurrency of it i'm not too sure on it right see so and then also the bus and the bus is a thing too right it's like it's two dollars for the bus so if i'm going to three different places that's six bucks that i need to make sure that i have in my pocket six dollars is a lot for somebody who's poor a homeless person or something like that houseless person let's try to get that lexicon too houseless people um are just the folk that cannot afford certain things so when we talk about food deserts and the cost of food it's one thing to not have food in an area um which makes anybody have to like move and go somewhere else right um but it's another thing to have like prices of that food go up so if i can only get if i can only get bread from the shorties on the corner and then the loaf of bread is six dollars right like that's that's three bus rides right now i have to consider do i go to work tomorrow catch the bus to go to work tomorrow or do i buy this bread so that i can feed my kids and i feel like the homeless population or excuse me the houseless population is one of those um effects yeah so i personally work at save a lot that's my current uh, job nice so as far as prices going up i do know a little bit about that due to complaints to the customers and stuff that i have to deal with as you can imagine what's one of the complaints you got and they're like oh my you know it didn't used to be this much or if they're getting like one of the little pies they're like oh my this used to be 25 cents i'm like i can't help you sir i'm sorry <laughs> is it all these like gray-haired women coming up to you like or women and men like is it older people or is it like like middle-aged people who's the people complaining the most most times it is the older ones because they're the ones that remember further back to the cheaper times <laughs> but sometimes occasionally it's the ones that are like in their 30s and 40s as well it's kind of like the midlife people as well it's never really the young millennia mm. but uh getting to the topic at hand mm -hmm. with the prices going up and the houseless people would you think it'd be a lot easier if we have like a say um a store that gives like a no it's like they don't need money to mm. run their operation. They just kind of donate the food to the homeless, the houseless, right? Yeah. So don't you think that'll make it a little bit easier because then they can focus on more saving their money instead of buying more expensive food just to make a living every day? Yeah. I mean, not only would it be easier, but you already have organizations like Feed the West. Okay. You got um, the Black Market. This is on uh, Market Street. It's a store on Market Street. Uh, Feed the West, Black Market. Oh, what is the... Maybe Feed the West is the one. So anyway, these are two organizations that have those programs that feed um, folk. But see, the problem is, right, in our society, because we're a capitalistic society, there is this trickle-down theory that you're supposed to donate your extra food and your extra money to houseless people because we need to help, right? And you get into a mode of depending on these programs like feed the west like kentucky black market where that's the only way these people are accessing food right and this is a problem because what happens when you know the trickle down stops right like i don't always have canned goods to give i don't always have extra food to give and i really don't have extra money to give right so if we're depending on feeding houseless folk or even people in food deserts, all based on the good hearted nature of the people in the community. It's just not sustainable, bro. That being said, there's a saying um, my mom used to tell it to me. If mm. there's a will, there's a way. Mm. So I got a scenario for you. OK, if you place yourself as in you were one of those uh, houseless people's shoes, how would you suggest getting out of the loop? The endless cycle Ooh. of having to eat from like donations and then wake up, try to survive the next day and repeat. Right. So that's a um, that's more of a difficult question just because I know that houseless folk um, suffer from mental problems. Right. They have uh, um, addiction um, issues as well. Uh, addiction has just been placed as a disease, too. So it's fair to say, like, there are sick people. A lot of houseless folk are just sick and they need certain medical help to get things. Now, you're saying me. Right. I'm a different breed, bro. Like, <laughs> I've thought about this often. Like, I would ride around the city looking at places I would shack up. Like, I, if I was home, houseless, where would I live? One. Two, how would I get money? I juggle. I juggle adeptly. Like, three three balls. Like, I can juggle adeptly. There's nobody on the corner asking for money juggling. Mm -hmm. And if they was, I would give them money because it's a talent, right? You feel me? So, like, for me personally, if I was to put in my shoes, bro, I'm only going to be houseless for, like, a month. 
I'm mm-hmm. getting this money, bro. Like I'm posted up in Nulu juggling. I'm posted up on Ninth Street juggling. I'm posted up by uh, Oxmoor juggling. Like <laughs> Cold Jer, right, I'm gonna give me a shrine Shriners hat and make people believe that I'm like with the Shriner Circus with a bucket. And I'm gonna go and collect money on the side. I'm gonna get me a jersey, bro, and three little homeless kids, and we gonna go on the side and talk <laughs> about we raise money for a football program. Like I'm going to get out. Please leave. <laughs> That is the most creative thing I've heard so far. That's hilarious. <laughs> you say it's creative, bro, but this is all things that I've seen before. Like, this is all the stuff, the panhandlers that we have in the West, the panhandlers that we have. Um, again, I live in the West, and that's kind of my stomping grounds. Like, the panhandlers in that area, they have different things that they do. There's a, there's a, there's a, a sports team that has been raising money for the past four years, and, bro, I don't think they have a sports team. I mean, it's four years, and I've given them plenty of money. So, like, I don't know why they're still raising money, if unless it's just a, it's just one of those those hustles. Redlining is directly connected with businesses i.e. restaurants um, not being in certain areas right because they couldn't get loans for the building they couldn't get um, or they would have to get if they did get a loan it would be a stupid interest rate or the payment for the building was just like ridiculous because the government literally our government sat down and said if you're trying to start a business in this area it will be more or you just flat out cannot do it like you cannot give loans you can't do anything so there are tons of research that are directly connected to um, from redlining to food deserts and a book that I would suggest is color the color of law by uh, Rothstein I don't know Richard Rothstein the color of law bro breaks down how the government from like from like 18 no from like 1920 all the way to present he breaks down how the government redlined and restricted access to economic um you know funds or economic things uh social things like clubs and things that you libraries things that you do to have fun and um food health care right there's no hospitals no nothing so yes bro uh, direct connection from redlining if anything i would say redlining is the reason for food deserts all right, I'm going to connect that to another piece. Mm. But first, I got a question to ask you. Back mm. to the homeless situation. With the homeless situation, as you're aware, in the West End, there's tons of abandoned houses, mm-hmm. like boarded up, just left there for years on end. Mm-hmm. Do you think it'll be a problem for the government to just, you know, clean it out and just have them live there? Yeah, absolutely. You would lose money, bro. Like, there's, 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 um, the government. Even though we think that the government is it serves the people, it really serves corporations, right? And the corporations have lobbied; they have the money to petition against the government making um, changes. One to fix the houses up costs money, and then to rent the houses out, like a houseless person doesn't have a regular job or some steady job. So whoever corporation or whatever government entity that made that building, they will not be able to make any profit off of that building. So that's why the government will not um, refurbish or do do up houses. Louisville could be the first metropolitan city to end homelessness. We really could. And we would actually save more money by getting people off the street from having to clean folk up from ambulance rides and uh, the city having to pay for ODs and stuff like that, overdoses and like uh, mental health issue things like if we w- the money that we pay for that would easily be made up for if we put them in houses. But again, corporations private corporations cannot make any money off that so they're not going to allow the government to take their house i understand Mm -hmm. and i'll admit i'm not much of a businessman but let's do a theoretical here cool so if we go on the theory that the government did get the homeless people the abandoned houses right Mm -hmm. so that should be enough roughly enough for all the homeless and probably put near to an end of our homeless population in louisville Mm -hmm. with that being said although they wouldn't initially get paid if the homeless people have a steady home, that means they don't have to worry about moving from place to place constantly, going long distances, having to hide under bridges or anything like that. They have a stable home they can warm up in, they can feel safe and secure in. Don't you think that uh encourage them to get jobs and then that'll actually increase the work population? Because I know we have like a lot of absences in the workforce, mm-hmm. especially in jobs such as like UPS and stuff like mm-hmm. that. I heard there's like a lot of absences from my customers. Mm-hmm. So due to that, don't you think that having more of those homeless people more motivated to work to keep the home that they're in that they've gotten as like 
um, most are religious, so I would say like a blessing for God for most of them. Mm-hmm. They'll want to work harder, pay that back, and then that's even more income coming to their way than what it is right now. Yeah, well, um, this is it's a mixed bag, but I'll say because um, a lot of uh, houseless people chose to be houseless, so that's something that we need to consider. But I would say that, yes, bro, like you need an address. Your job is going to send you things, and you must have an address for those things to be sent. So off top, yes, giving um, – houseless folk somewhere to live or just somewhere safe to sleep at night would definitely i wouldn't say give them the motivation to work but it definitely gives them the stability to hold down some type of work yeah okay yeah, so we agree that's kind of like a likelihood though mm-hmm, very much so okay so um you're a justice fighter right mm-hmm. and being a justice fighter you've had experiences with racism right yeah man. so tie into the food desert the homeless problem and the redlining don't you think that that's kind of racist? Yeah. 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 No, I mean, it is. Um, but. So I need uh, like I, and everybody listening to this podcast. Love, love, love. Thank you all so much for tuning in. What are you all calling the podcast? Uh, I don't think we have a name. Uh, the name Wagner yet? podcast, I think. Ooh, I'm not too OK, sure. okay. we're going to have to cut that in. We're going to be like, welcome, welcome, welcome to. Blagner. No, no. Blagner. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, but no. Um, like classism. All right. So racism is a symptom of classism. I need everybody to understand that racism is a symptom of classism. Classism has to deal with money and economics. It's not a race thing as much as it's an economic thing. There are poor white people in Portland. Portland is in the West End. There's a lot of white folks that are under like way below the poverty line in Louisville in the West End. They are also red line. They are also um, caught in food deserts. And what we find is that it's not. Yes, it was racist when uh, the guy who built Ninth Street, he built a road through he built a whole highway through Ninth Street to separate Beecher Terrace or the West End from the business districts of downtown. That's why we have that huge um, highway in between Ninth Street that is is definitely racist but and in his like reasoning in the city's reasoning for creating it it's they even mentioned keep like stay away from the negroes like they even mentioned something race so i would definitely say that is racism but it came down like that racism was only like that decision to make that highway only came from a economic or money standpoint in that i want the downtown money to be safe from the black no money this has been the Justice For You podcast. We want to thank all the interviewers, all the interviewees, and all the people who support the work of the podcast. 